This is Mrs. Palmer Quay with a short video on writing a formal science report. This video is designed for students who have to prepare a research project final report, either one for a science fair project or for an individual research project as part of the honors requirement for a class. It's also useful for people who are writing a formal report for a lab experiment, not the reports that I ask you to do in your notebook, but the typed paper, more formal science report. So here are some general tips on writing a formal, formal science report. Since you're a scientist, it's important that you are concise. Scientists want the facts and just the facts, ma'am. Uh, you don't need to add a lot of fluff. Just tell us what happened and why. You do want to describe things well. You do want to provide a good discussion of your experiment. But you want to be straight and to the point. In formal reports, you write in the third person, which can feel kind of peculiar, but we don't want to hear about what you think using first-person words of I or me. But use the researcher or the investigator. Use the third person. Talk about yourself as if you're somebody else. You want to write about what really happened, not what you hope to have happened or what should have happened, given the background information. Science can be messy. Things don't always work out. We have error happening. Tell us, tell it like it is in this paper. You will be using sources because you're going to be writing this background research section, and so you want to use credible sources, sources that we can depend upon that they're giving you good facts. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's very important that you're using good sources and that you cite your sources pro properly. You need to give credit where credit is due for the facts that you have received and put into your paper. This is not a personal response to anything. This is a fact-based, a research-based paper, and you need to use citations properly. You need to include them when you have paraphrased or quoted another place as a source. Specifically, you want to use proper formatting. I'm looking for papers that are typed, double-spaced, one-inch margin, 12-point font, give me page numbers. The standard stuff that I hopefully that you're doing in preparing papers for your literature classes. I would like you to use the MLA format for your citations. This is not a science format but I, I'm not going to ask you to learn another format just for my papers and many of literature classes do use MLA so that is fine. You want to use subheadings to identify different sections, and we're going to get into the sections in a future slide. And if you include any graphs or tables or pictures, which can be very good when you're uh, documenting what's happening in a research project, but if you do any, you need to properly label them. So if you include a graph, you want to make sure you're labeling what the axis is. You want to give titles or figure names to all of the uh, illustrations that you are putting into your report. These are the sections that will be generally included in a research project report or a class experiment formal report. There needs to be a title page. This would include the name of the experiment or project, my name, the date, the class, etc. If you're doing a class experiment formal report, you do not need to include an abstract. But if you're doing a research project, when you have finished the experiment, you need, or when you finish the whole report, you need to write a one paragraph summary of what happened in your experiment and what the results are. And this comes right after the title page is sort of, um, it's like the book cover um, jacket, you know, the book jacket, the little summary that's inside a book telling you what to expect. Though in an abstract, you do include the results. You don't leave people hanging. You give all the spoilers. Both types of reports have to have this introductory background research section, and the, the only difference would really be the length. In your introduction, you want to state what your purpose or a research question for your project or lab experiment was. You need to provide background research, which I'll go over in a little bit more detail later. In this introductory section, you also state your hypothesis and what the variables are for your experiment. The background research part is probably the part that is the most difficult in this section, and I will talk a little bit more about it later. Then you need to provide a, mat a materials list and a list of your experimental procedure. These things are pretty self-explanatory. When you're discussing your results, in your formal report or uh, personal project report, 
you want to include your raw data, include all of the information you have neatly organized in tables or in graphs, whatever makes the most sense. Provide an example of any calculations that you had to do. You don't necessarily have to include all of them, just give an example of what you did. You want to restate the important results in sentence form, not just have it on the graph or the tables, but to provide underneath the raw data a summary of what the important information is in a sentence. And then you go on to explain things in the next section. In the discussion section is where you do the explanations. You want to talk about in your discussion section what is the significance of the results, what does it show, what does it prove. In this you are basically showing that you understand what happened in the experiment. This is where you're letting us know that you understand what you did and what it really means. In the discussion section you also can exper compare your expected results with your actual results because remember I said you want to write what really happened. If you had some uh, really strange results, you can talk about your experimental error, analyze what went wrong, um, make it, you know, suggestions for how you can improve it in the future. And you want to tie the results back to the purpose or question, research question that you stated in the very beginning. So you want to have that as the kind of the cohesive theme as you move through your explanation in this paper. You end with a very short conclusion. This is just a, a sentence or two sentence a summary that connects definite conclusions from the lab with the research question. So it's just sort of your final word that is said at the end. And then because you are going to find sources for your background research part of your introduction, you need to include a reference list that is citing your sources. In general, a research project report is running 10 to 15 pages when you get all of this in there with double spaced and um, pictures and graphs and such, whereas a lab experiment report is more like three to five pages. So what about this introduction or background research section? What are you doing in this? Well, basically, you're talking about what the reader needs to know in order to understand what's happening in this paper. And you go with the assumption that the reader really doesn't know a lot. So you, it is okay to explain things fully. You also want to go see if there's any other research that helps explain your expected results or helps explain why you predict something. What other research has something to do with whatever topic you are talking about. Whatever terms you use, chemical names, um, you know, the words that you're using to explain things in your report should be defined. And again, as I said, assume the, that your reader is not terribly knowledgeable. If you're doing calculations, what are the formulas that you are going to be using? You need to state those and explain what they are showing. You want to make the, your planned experiment, the connection between your planned experiment and this section clear as you finish up your introductory section. So you give us all this background information that helps, you understand, helps us understand what you're doing, and then you end by stating what you're going to do because the, state, the section that follows your introductory section are the nitty-gritty details of your materials and your procedure, and so you already want to have introduced your planned experiment, talked about what the hypothesis is, presented what your dependent and independent variables are in the introductory part. This background research section will include citations because all facts that are not common knowledge must have a source citation. They must. Even if you paraphrase a source, you still need to give credit. If you, and especially, as you already know, if you include a quote, you have to indicate the source. You have not done the original research. You've not developed these facts. And so you need to give credit to where you're getting it from. If you're using a short quote, you can include it in the text and put quotation marks around it. But if you have a longer quote, and the general recommendation is if it's going to run longer than four lines, that you set it off as an indented block quotation. You're going to use parenthetical references in the text. That means you're going to put parentheses around information that tells you where the source is. And this follows your quote. And then you would use the MLA formatting style, as I said before, in how you set things up. This is really, really important. All facts that are not common knowledge must have a source citation.
And finally, you want to look for a minimum of three sources. Often you're using more than that, but your minimum goal is to find three sources. So because of that, you need to choose a reputable source because you need to be getting your information from a good place. You can use Wikipedia to find original sources, but you do not cite Wikipedia in formal science papers. Thankfully, Wikipedia does usually include some original sources at the bottom of their general articles on a subject. So you can look up your topic and then you scroll down to the bottom of the page. I mean, you can read what they say for background information and scroll down to the bottom of the page to find some more reputable sources to quote in your paper. Other good places to look are educational or governmental sites or websites that are run by scientific organizations, or these are called non-governmental organizations, NGOs. And so they have words like International Society of such and such, or the Organization of such and such, or the National whatever organization. Be cautious about websites run by a single person or a blog. Again, sometimes they can point you to a, a piece of information that you can find a more reputable source to use as your uh, quotation, your citation, but generally steer away from something that's just a single person's opinion. Make sure that you've got a solid backing of where this information is coming from. I'm going to just talk about some examples. The chem My chemistry classes are writing a formal report on the stoichiometry lab. And so in your background information section, because I think this is probably the part that gives people the most difficulty, you want to discuss such things as what are decomposition reactions, what happens in general in a decomposition reaction, what are the reactants and potential products for this particular reaction? And you can include, since our, we are reacting sodium bicarbonate, you could go back and look in history, you know, who discovered it or how do we use sodium bicarbonate. You can include all this kind of background information in this introductory section. Since we're decomposing sodium bicarbonate, you might want to see, is there a contemporary reason to decompose sodium bicarbonate? Where do we use decomposed sodium bicarbonate in life today? And then give an example and discussion of the type of calculations that you will be doing in this lab and how your experiment will determine what the product is, which is the whole research question you're trying to investigate in this lab. For an example of a more formal research project, here's one that's been done in my biology class where someone was identifying what temperature enzymes deactivated. They were using pineapple, fresh pineapple as a source of the enzymes and little blocks of jello as the protein substrate that the enzyme was acting on. And so in the background research section, the introductory section of their formal report, they were able to talk about what are enzymes, where are they found, who discovered them, um, just provide some, again, basic information, defining terms, giving an explanation of what you are looking at in the experiment, why is it important. Then going on to what will deactivate an enzyme, since that is the purpose of this particular lab, so you need to explain what do you mean by deactivation, what factors will cause that to happen, how does it become deactivated, how does it change the enzyme so it no longer works. Some explanation about the test substance is always good. This is what, you know, what are you testing it on and why. Explaining how you will know that the enzyme has been deactivated, how you know the experiment has been successful. And then, of course, are there any safety concerns, which I forgot to put on the previous slide, but whenever you're working with any kind of chemical, it's always good to bring in safety concerns. Is this a, a substance you need to be worried about or not? When you're doing text citations, in this, as you're talking about these types of facts that you're looking up for this part of the paper, in the text itself, you just need to include the author and the page number. So it's an author page set up in parentheses. Since we're often doing websites, there may not be a page. Um, and there really is no problem having all your sources come from websites. I don't need you to try to find a book. Not not in this day and age. It can all come off the internet. So you're looking for the author. Sometimes you don't have an author and you use the title instead of the author for your in-text citations. Remember that your in-text citations will follow any fact that is not common knowledge. Whether you have given a direct quote or if you've just paraphrased some information, you do need to provide a citation. 
At the end of the paper, you're going to list all of the works that you cited. This can be either a works cited page or a reference list. Either one is acceptable. But you don't want to use the word bibliography because that is one that's used for when you have footnotes in your paper. And we're using parenthetical references. The information that needs to be provided in your works cited list is in this order. You need to have the author followed by the title of the website or the article or the book. And the titles are given in italics nowadays. We're not using underline anymore. Then you have the publisher, which can be the website itself, the home page name, along with the date. And that's often found on the very bottom of the web page. Then the type of media. So if, if you're pulling something off the web, you would just write web here. The date that you looked it up, the date you accessed it and the URL. MLA does not require ULL, URLs, but I do in my papers, so be sure to include that address. I will be giving you a short handout, sending you a handout that gives you some more details on MLA style, but I would suggest that if you have questions, you can Google Purdue OWL. Uh, the OWL stands for an online writing lab, and there is a lot of good information about writing papers and how you put in your uh, references for MLA and a variety of other um, formatting styles. So it is a very useful site for someone who has to write a paper. So that covers what I wanted to tell you about writing a formal science report. I hope this will help you get your head together on doing this paper. Um, it's, it is a paper for your science class, and it can be you know, a considerable project, but we're, it is something, a skill that you do need to know as you're going into doing science classes in college.